This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. We the last of a dying breed. You'll never see another crew like this, I promise you. Everybody got money in their pocket. Everybody move as one. You fight, I'm gonna fight with you. We all gonna fight. Let's turn it into something. Now we're gonna tear the club up. Georgia. The pride of Dixie is known for warm weather and southern hospitality. Atlanta's is this place that does evoke this sort of southern charm and sort of, you know, a little bit of old south sensibilities. The city is a melting pot. That's what's crazy about Atlanta is everybody friendly. Everybody been cool. White people, black people, Mexicans. But Atlanta has also gained a reputation as a drug hub. Here, main thing with is cocaine and weed. You know, crack, weed, ecstasy. That, that's what the younger generation is on right now. And one gang has dominated the trade. The Black Mafia Family, or BMF. When you heard of BMF, you already knew the club was gonna get shut down, meaning big party, 100 deep, Lamborghinis, Bentleys, Ferraris. All the cocaine on the streets of Atlanta, the crack in the bad parts of town, the cocaine in the high-end clubs, all of it was from BMF. It was just unbelievable to believe that there was this black organization that had shut everybody down, that this is the only group of people who were bringing cocaine in. They control sales on the streets and are a force in the clubs. I mean, you know all eyes on you. You got cars that ain't even out yet pulling up. Once we're in the club, they got a section for us. Bottles already set up. Afterwards, a uh, penthouse suite. You got girls that come up there, not even strippers, you know what I'm saying? They want to get naked in front of you just because who you are. The gang parties with the rich and famous. From basketball players, actresses, actors, the A-list. We were some young black men from the streets that kicked it with the A-list. Lil C asked to have his real name withheld for his own protection. He grew up on Atlanta's west side. I come from the streets, so anybody that know about Atlanta, that's a hard rural area for anybody to come up in. So you're known, you're prone to the drugs, you're maddened to the violence. Little C got a taste of gang life at an early age. I actually started off being a lookout for the drug dealer. And what they'll do was they'll Pay me some money, say if the police come in. He joined BMF in 2004 and thrived on the gang's notorious reputation. When you have black mafia family, just the word mafia scares people. BMF's reputation is well earned. They rolled as a, a large group and they always appeared to have a lot of money and a lot of weapons and a willingness to use force to get what they wanted. If you want to have some fun, come on up here. Let's have some fun. But if you want to bring a problem, we could turn it into a problem. 33-year-old Bull also asked to have his real name withheld for his own protection. In 1999, Bull moved from the mean streets of Compton to Atlanta after joining BMF. It was supposed to just be coming to party. It was supposed to be like a two-week, two-week party. Turned into, I live in Atlanta now. 
he was seduced by the gang's endless flow of cash. If it's 30 of us, right? 30 different dudes with $1,000 in their pocket is 30,000. So imagine if 30 different dudes got five or $10,000 in their pocket. For Bull, backup was never far away. Look at us, we 50, 60 deep up here. You wanna come try to fight one dude? You think you really gonna win? One man runs BMF, Demetrius Flannery, AKA Big Meech. When you talk about Meech, you can't say little nothing. His name Big Meech. So everything he did was big, from the flashiest cars, the iciest ice, the baddest chicks, the most expensive champagne, that was him. He's very intelligent. He just got a Fortune 500 mind, but he got a street mentality. Big Meech founded the gang with a simple goal, to make money. We had money, we been had money. Money ain't nothing. A lot of don't like to spend their money. We love to spend our money. We can't take none of this with us. He was really skilled at just creating this buffer of people who he knew he could trust um, that would come in much handier as he kind of rose the ranks. He lived a life most drug dealers could only dream of. Well, this dude got the city. He got the city, he had the whole city. Everybody knew how he moved, everybody knew who he was. I'm watching the stars, he moving them out the way. I'm like, oh, this dude got it. When we go out at night, Whatever we spend, 50,000, 100,000 in the motherfucking club, we can afford to do it because we ain't bring it all with us. <laughs> Simple. Meets love the strip club, man. I mean, every night, even if we go to a regular club, we gonna probably hit the strip club first. We get there at 2.30, and we keep the club open at 4, 5 o'clock. And the girls will stay, because they know they gonna make their money. Meach got me in the chains. You know, he took me out and was like, man, you know, you gotta do this. This is the kind of chain you gotta wear. One of Big Meech's favorite playgrounds is the exclusive Buckhead area on the city's north side. But you have Tuxedo Drive, which sounds exactly like it is. You have Paces, you know, which, which goes right past uh, the Governor's Mansion. It's also where BMF's good times spiraled out of control. November 11th, 2003. Big Meech, Bull, and Lil C were partying at the nightclub Chaos. Yeah, we was there in Buckhead that night when everything went down. We all partied around, you know, Buckhead. The gang was hanging with the former bodyguard to Sean Diddy Combs, Anthony Wolf Jones. Jones was a well-known character in Atlanta and well beyond, who actually was friends with Meech, at least at one point. He was sort of um, P. Diddy's like most coveted muscle for a time. Wolf and, you know, his team, they came and partied in Atlanta a lot. We just knew of them being some cats from New York or something. The mood changed when Wolf exchanged words with Big Meech over a girl. Wolf was thrown out of the club. We in the club partying. Why you come to the club on a fight? Like it was really, Meech felt he got dissed and Wolf felt he got dissed. Which goes to show Demetrius Flannery can have people just summarily dismissed you know, from the club. Ain't no fight can happen in any club just for somebody stepping on your shoe. So yeah. The club closed at 4 a.m. Meech walked out only to find Wolf waiting for him. Yeah, he, just because he knew P. Diddy didn't mean he was P. Diddy. He was a grunt anyway. I mean, he should have never stepped up like that. Suddenly, guns were pulled. They were fired upon. Uh, the BMF group returned fire. There's something like 40 rounds fired off um, in a packed parking lot with all kinds of people watching. 
panicked. The crowd started to scatter as the bullets flew. Wolf was shot in the chest. Three more people were hit, including Big Meech. He was shot from behind in the ass. His buddy had been shot in the foot. Just go on and walk away from him, take that one on the chin and just walk. You violate, we gonna demonstrate. And that's what it was. Atlanta, Georgia. The ATL is the unofficial capital of the South. It's also home to the Black Mafia family, or BMF. This flashy gang dominates the drug trade throughout the South. You live the dream. Just imagine you could get anything you want when you want. New car come out like, man, I got a hat at, go get it. You want it, go get it. BMF grew out of a brotherhood born 30 years ago on the streets of Detroit, Michigan. Southwest Detroit, 1980. Demetrius Flannery and his younger brother, Terry, grew up in poverty. They quickly learned how to hustle to survive. The brothers started out selling $50 bags of crack, you know, on street corners, like everybody else around them really at the time. The brothers soon wanted more. Most guys in that neighborhood who went into the drug game might have risen up to a certain level, but Meech, along with his brother Terry, had their sights way, way higher. Meech knew it took both brains and brawn to get ahead on the streets. He started to see a whole other lifestyle that he would only dream of having one day. And with that, he started to see how easy it was to make money. Terry started a taxi service that quickly became a front company. The brothers now had an easy way to move product around Detroit, but their styles were very different. For Meech's glamour lifestyle, Terry was the exact opposite. Very content to live off, live off his success, quietly. In 1988, Meech got busted for possession and was sentenced to two years probation. But he learned from his mistake. From that point forward, he had a rotating door of fake IDs that were convincing enough that didn't get him in trouble. In 1989, Meech was looking for a city on the rise and moved from Detroit to Atlanta. So everybody they knew when they wanted to come to move some drugs, they could come to Atlanta. We right by Florida. We right by Texas. Atlanta, you can't, you can't come out here and not want to stay. Nightlife, you know, clubbing all night. Clubs don't close till 5, 6 in the morning. Some clubs don't even close. Together, the brothers set up shop. They sat down with the, many of the distributors themselves and said, you know, we'll supply your cocaine so you can supply it to everybody else. We'll give you a better price. You can see he knows what he's talking about. He knows what he wants, and he's going to get what he wants. In the mid-1990s, the brothers got their big break, a hookup with a Mexican drug cartel. Once they had access to vast amounts of wholesale kilos, that changed everything for them. So then they became major players on a national scale. BMF was buying mass quantities. Um, kilos going for 9,000, then turn around selling for 17,000, you're doubling your money. To make things easier, Terry moved from Detroit to Los Angeles to handle the incoming shipments. They needed to have properties in LA because they needed a place to receive these cocaine shipments that were Colombian cocaine bound over from Mexico coming into Southern California. The brothers set up a network across the country with hubs in St. Louis, Detroit, and Atlanta. They had connections and pipelines in most of the major cities in the United States. Federal authorities kept tabs on the brothers, hoping to gather enough evidence for an indictment. 
They were laying low and they were quiet in the 90s, but they were also on the Fed's radar even back then. Terry's name having shown up in like 22 DEA case files in the 90s alone. In 2000, Meech gave his drug organization a name, Black Mafia Family. I don't think it's any coincidence that BMF is also um, Big Meech Flannery. I mean, those initials mirror each other. Every man plays his own role, and everything starts with the leader. I'm a good leader, so I got good people that follow. While BMF's cocaine empire grew, Big Meech threw his money toward his legitimate passion, music. BMF helps a lot of people. We help a lot of people in this industry. You know what I'm saying? T.I., Jeezy. A lot of people wouldn't even be out if it wasn't because of us. If Meats didn't have them playing their music in the clubs. Big Cuz asked to have his real name withheld for his own protection. Cuz met Meach in 1999 and soon began producing songs for BMF Entertainment. We all started making real good music, changing up our styles uh, to coincide with the South music. Everybody want to know what BMF is, you know what I mean? Meech's street cred helped propel the young artists. The push from Meech, you know, him being certified, he was actually doing what a lot of the rappers and stuff was out here rapping about and portraying. And the first time that BMF really became sort of visible was when Meech started showing up in the clubs in Atlanta with a crew of guys around him wearing t-shirts that said BMF. By 2003, Meech and Terry had a falling out and separated their crews. But William Doc Marshall worked for both men. He appeared to be the person that facilitated all the transfers of money and kept track of the money for much of the organization. William, or Bill Doc Marshall, was kind of the money man who helped finance BMF's illegal activities. BMF's resources were vast. They purchased cocaine in bulk at a discount, taking hundreds of kilos at a time, cutting them up, and then selling them at a premium. Everybody was happy. There was enough of it to go around. Yeah, 88, 92% pure cocaine. All you have to do is step on it once. BMF became a major player in Atlanta's hip hop and party scenes as Meech threw his dollars around. It was just bottles, bottles everywhere. Everybody had their own bottle. You could order a bottle how you want it. Well, 100 of us in there, there'd be 100 bottles over there. If you ain't in the club with a bottle, why are you in the club? Every place we stay at, L L.A., Atlanta, Detroit, we have homes, our own homes. We don't have to go in and rent them. And we can't be stopped. BMF presented itself as a music promoter, but authorities knew where the cash was coming from. There would be like a drug seizure here, not from the brothers directly, but like through a courier or some money seized. You know, that was enough to raise some eyebrows even on the federal level. Then, in September 2003, federal authorities got a break. BMF member William Doc Marshall had shot an intruder, breaking into his Atlanta home. When police responded to the scene, they found a kilo of cocaine and something else. Marshall cleaned out there downstairs, which was a large safe. Their crawl space was, it was like a large bank safe. It was a bank vault built into their, their house. The safe was the size of a small room. Inside, they found a ledger that detailed Marshall's role in BMF's drug operation. These ledgers had um, nicknames in them. They had sort of columns like Cali Run or like a cell phone bill, car notes, all these things that investigators knew had to do with the drug trade. Federal authorities now had a clear connection between BMF and cocaine. But they didn't have any evidence on Big Meech. 
In fact, they didn't even know where he lived. At that point, the feds believed that he lived in this big house that they knew to be called by BMF insiders the White House. It was used to stash lots of cocaine. We're talking 100 kilos or more. With Marshall in custody, Meech wasn't taking any chances. They're clever. I think they knew they were being followed. Atlanta, Georgia. The cocaine trade in the 404 is ruled by one gang, the Black Mafia family. No matter where you went, no matter who you bought it from, they were three people removed from the Black Mafia family. BMF says its success is because it's smarter than the competition and the feds. Not one member of BMF ever had a phone registered anywhere close to their name. We'd be listening to them, they'd be like, hold on, and they'd another next cell, and then another next cell, the direct connects. The gang's leaders, Meech and Terry Flannery, have drug pipelines into major cities across the U.S. From Atlanta, they moved drugs out to New York, parts of South Carolina, Kentucky, parts of Florida. Pretty vast network. They were in the upscale neighborhoods of every state that they were in. They were in the richest of every state that they were in. The gang also has a fleet of custom-made vehicles built for transporting their product. They would have these elaborate um, traps, basically secret compartments and limousines that certain car customization shops would outfit them with. They have to turn on the lights once or twice, you know, maybe put the interim wiper on, turn the heat up this way, close that vent, press here and doors would open up and it's amazing machinery. It would pop open a secret deoxygenated compartment where you could hold really as many as 100 keys or so. If a driver gets stopped by police, BMF is prepared. When a BMF guy would get picked up, they all had these Tennessee driver's licenses and they would always check out. They were not fakes. They actually had legit licenses that weren't them. <laughs> and their rides are nearly untraceable. They'd use your girlfriend's, your girlfriend's father's, sister's, boyfriend's name. And he'd sign for it. And they'd give a hundred thousand hour check. Okay? You know, and but leave nine thousand hours left to be paid. So it'd always be leaned. So if the car got seized, you come back, well the dealership gets the car back car dealer turns around and leases it back out to another BMF or repaints it. You know, because they, there's still a lien on there, a security interest. Very clever not to have anything in their names. Once the cocaine is unloaded, the cars are put to use again. From the hubs, the cars would go out with cocaine and then they would collect money, you know, sometimes as much as a million dollars in cash bring it back to the hubs, and then you know, the money laundering process would begin. In Atlanta, the gang keeps its drugs and money at four stash houses. Meech had fortresses. Top-notch, high-tech house, some with elevators in them. And these were nice houses, and these were all gated houses with surveillance and security. The Black Mafia family keeps its membership exclusive. That's what everybody want to know. How do I be down, man? What I got to do to get in? Like, man, we don't take sign-ups. It ain't like you go down to the beach and, hey, you got BMF sign-ups around the corner. Members join for life. But everybody as a whole, from Meech, everybody in his circle, they treated everybody amongst the family as family. They always was family first. You need to use that Ferrari? Go use the Ferrari. You could drive it too. You know what I'm saying? You crash it, we get another one. You know what I mean? There ain't no other crew like this in the world, and it never will be. We have money. Money ain't nothing without us being together. BMF members state their loyalty with a single phrase, death before dishonor. You hear BMF death before this honor. Is you down for me, I ride for you. That goes along with being part of this family. You gotta be true to what we're doing. 
We all know what we was doing. It wasn't like somebody's making you do this. Ain't nobody made me do nothing. Big Meech works hard to push the BMF brand in hip hop circles. He always been into music, always promoted other people's music. He's very well respected by most artists, you know, in the industry. Any club that BMF go to, that's the club that you want to be at. Meech flaunts his assets in this rap video. Everybody on the basketball court had to crowd around everything, you know what I'm saying? We had the helicopter view. We actually had the cars and we was actually driving our cars in the video. BMF member Bull joined Meech in front of the cameras. I never really thought I'd be in a video either. Once you start seeing cameras and all of that, you start like, man, it's, it's happening. Much of BMF's bling is one of a kind. I'm watching how people react to it. I'm looking how it look. I'm like, man, you know, it do look nice. They be like, damn, man, all y'all wear is all black. Oh, nah, man, but they make the jewelry look good. You got a floss. I mean, we had probably 10 chains with BMF. When the light hit them, it looked like your, like your chain is dripping off your neck. Everybody get extras around here. Everybody shining like new money. And they were very, very expensive. You know, tens and tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes worth a million or more. Everything was like decadent, even in a world where decadence is kind of the norm. BMF's opulence was on display at Meech's 36th birthday party. It was not like a small little intimate gathering among friends. He rented out an entire club, a huge, huge mega club. The theme of the party was Meech of the Jungle. I mean, dogs, cats, no. He wants tigers, lions. It was a big ass elephant. The more funny part to me is that, man, there's a damn elephant in the club. You got an elephant in the club, man. You were served by a waitress that was naked. Their bodies were pavement, as if they were in the jungle. Meech was the self-proclaimed king and celebrated like one. His name was spelled out in like six foot tall neon letters. Really, really, really just eating it up. Everybody get French benefits around here. Whatever a woman want, we got right here. You don't buy the bottles at a BMF party. You don't buy no drinks at a BMF party. Everything is already paid for. We don't need your money. This was the, one of the biggest parties ever to grace Atlanta. It was a night to remember for BMF. A few uninvited guests made sure of that. And at the same time, you have a white van parked outside. Law enforcement watching him then just kind of keeping tabs. Atlanta, Georgia, November 2003. The Black Mafia family, or BMF, was partying at a posh nightclub when shots rang out in the parking lot. Fighting is one thing. Once some guns start going off, it's, it's, it's all negativity from there. The gang's leader, Demetrius Flannery, AKA Big Meech, was shot while fleeing the scene. One man lay dead, while Anthony Wolf Jones, the former bodyguard to Sean Diddy Combs, lay on the ground. He had taken multiple bullets to the chest. Wolf, who's a very large individual, was able to hold on for a bit, but he died at the hospital. So Meech winds up in the hospital too. He had been shot in the ass. He was arrested by Atlanta PD and charged with a double homicide. The public was outraged. So after that kind of stuff happens, you got people always like, well, you know, they're a gang, you know, they're shooting up. We went from a family to a gang. It's the old South, and now all of a sudden you got the old dirty South coming in. After the arrest, the police finally were able to determine where Meech lived. In a mansion he called the White House. They were hoping to find a murder weapon there. They did not. Uh, but they did find a ton of records and other evidence that helped start building the case against BMF. 
The investigation turned up financial ledgers identical to those confiscated from BMF accountant William Doc Marshall. They had seen the same nicknames and the same phone numbers in all these files. The ledgers gave authorities the beginnings of a case against BMF, but they needed more proof to put them away. The authorities put Meech under constant surveillance after a judge released him to house arrest. He was fine with that. He had a shelf, he had a maid, he was fine. He accepted it. We still, we was popping bottles, drinking Cristal, Rose Perrier at the house, four Ferraris in the garage. We was not gonna let Meech having a, a murder case pending stop what he wanted to do. Meech put the spotlight on himself even more by producing and starring in rap videos. His plan was to do exactly what he set out to do, to have a lifestyle that was so big and so massive that it would almost take everyone by storm. BMF was running Atlanta and wanted everyone to know it. They had billboards up in the city of Atlanta that said BMF Entertainment. As soon as you get off that plane, you go see that billboard to be in your face. The billboard taunted authorities. Well, this is the damn billboard I had to look at every morning when I went to work. Imagine if a bank robbing crew were to put a billboard up. <laughs> it just said, come into a bank near you. To make matters worse, the murder case against Meech was falling apart. Atlanta PD couldn't find the murder weapon, and no witnesses came forward. The whole murder case went dead. There was very little evidence of any that would tie him to them. This question, did Flannery shoot? Did he have a gun? But BMF wasn't out of trouble. July 25th, 2004. BMF was partying at a club called The Velvet Room. The Velvet Room was located on Peachtree Street, a very sort of swanky, high-end kind of club. People came to sort of show off at this club. When the club closed, BMF hit the streets full force. And they had this way that they lined themselves up. It was this formation, and you'd have the Bentley and the H2 and the BMW. Leaving the parking lot, the gang nearly ran over 23-year-old Roshanable Prince Drummond. It was so many people that moved and rolled with us. It was easy for somebody else to get into somebody and it spill off into us. Prince kind of smacked the side of the car, like, yo, you're hitting me. A couple guys jumped out of the car and got into what was essentially a fist fight with Prince and several of his friends beat them very, very badly. One of Prince's friends jumped in to try to stop the fight. He went into his car, grabbed a gun, and fired into the air to kind of try to break up the fight. But BMF was having none of it. After the warning shot, the BMF members were kind of getting ready to leave, getting in their cars. One of them went back to his car, grabbed a gun, walked back to the prince who was lying on the ground, unconscious, and shot him several times. Prince died at the scene. Fulton County Prosecutor Rand Shahey joined a joint federal and state task force. It had one goal, stopping BMF. It was becoming increasingly violent. Hit and runs, to bar fights, to shootings. What used to be, you know, in the 1990s when you'd settle things with your fists, were now being settled with Glocks um, or being run over by cars. But it was no closer to getting inside the gang. We couldn't find one person to ever say, yes, uh, I'm part of BMF, or yes, I know BMF, and yes, cocaine's coming from BMF. The task force's big break came when it intercepted a phone call about a large pending deal. I mean, he mentioned BMF and we were gone. The task force was able to secure a series of wiretaps, and each led to a higher level dealer. And that's how we got 
So we spun. We spun up. On this call, two BMF members discuss a meeting at a stash house, nicknamed the elevator. You gonna drive your car over there? To the elevator? I don't know how you how you feel about your new sh- being seen there because you, I already I want you to know that it very well may be seen. Do something a little more low key. The task force kept its eye on the prize. I mean, not even I thought I was big enough to take on someone like Mage, but I wanted him. Late November 2004. A message that BMF was bringing a large shipment of cocaine into one of its stash houses was intercepted. We were going to hit him. This was going to be it. But Meech felt the heat coming. Meech rightfully suspected, along with a bunch of other people, that they were about to get hit. Two days before Thanksgiving, authorities entered Meech's house. But they were too late. You know, they just left. Televisions were on. There was a marijuana blunt still burning in the ashtray when we hit that house. Meech had fled Atlanta for Miami. He even took along Lil C and Bull. It was official. BMF was on the run. We spent Christmas in Miami and New Year. Things in Atlanta was just getting a little too hot. Everywhere we went, it was faded. Atlanta, 2005. The Black Mafia family was running cocaine across the country and covering up its operation with a legitimate music business. But an Atlanta-based task force was closing in. A lot of the partying had stopped, so it was very on edge and the air was very thick. I would say that they were the most overt group of drug traffickers that I've ever seen. They brought, brought too much attention on themselves. On May 11, 2005, federal agents with a drug warrant were sent to pick up high-ranking BMF dealer Deron Gatling. They tracked him to a BMF house in Atlanta. We surrounded the house and knocked and announced our presence. Everyone denied that Mr. Gatling was inside of the house. We knew that that could not be the case. The agents eventually found Gatling hiding in the attic. There was a, actually a footprint, a foothold through the roof where Mr. Gatling had fallen through the attic and put his foot through the ceiling. But Gatling wasn't going without a fight. We identify Mr. Gatling in this small area in the attic. As we're pulling it open, the shots are fired. The radio traffic comes through is that, that we receive shots into our perimeter. It turns out BMF had set the agents up. If they're willing to do that to law enforcement officers, then the danger that they pose to the public is, in my mind, much greater. Federal authorities, including the U.S. Marshals, focused their attention on BMF's leader, Demetrius Big Meech Flannery. At this point, the Marshals are, are really aggressively trying to track down uh, Meech and his brother, Terry. On October 20th, 2005, Marshals tracked Meech to his new home in Dallas. We were able to surround the house. Um, we were forced to breach the door. Meech was arrested without incident at the back of the house. They found plenty of evidence to document his BMF lifestyle. In plain view, we found a small quantity of drugs, and we, we found a safe that had other weapons in it. And we found a large quantity of uh, jewelry. It was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not in the millions. With Meech behind bars, the task force turned its attention to Terry. Terry's hiding out um, in a friend's sort of suburban property out in St. Louis. We moved to the house, knocked and announced, and in the windows above the doors, um, the first face we saw was Terry looking out the window. Terry was arrested without resistance. There were people everywhere, and there was money everywhere. It looked as though they had a poker game uh, going in the dining room, and there was money stacked six and eight inches high in the dining room. 
With the BMF leaders in jail, the task force organized raids on the gang's operations around the country. There were 26 names on that first indictment. We have an ultimate 150 with suspected ties to BMF. The feds know who they want. They ain't not doing all that investigation for nothing. It ain't nobody to play with. Little C was lucky to escape charges. They done already got their wire taps, they already got their warrants and everything. So I was just blessed to not be on those, you know what I'm saying? Bull wasn't so lucky. He was arrested in 2007 and charged with attempting to purchase cocaine. Since everybody else had already got locked up, I knew I wasn't going to just be the only one that wasn't nothing going to happen to. Prosecutors estimated BMF's total drug earnings to be over $270 million. The Flannery brothers faced two counts of running a continuing criminal enterprise. That's a charge that's similar to a RICO. It's a vast conspiracy case. Unlike RICO, it's pretty much confined to drugs. In November 2007, Big Meech and Terry pled guilty to drug trafficking and money laundering. They were each sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. Close to 150 members of BMF were convicted on charges ranging from dealing drugs to weapons violations. Today, Atlanta is a different city without BMF. Those things just disappeared overnight. The wrapping, the wrapped cars, and the magnums, the billboards. The clubs got a lot more quiet. Little C has had to adjust to a calmer lifestyle. Because you're going from the biggest thing that you could ever see, that you're going back to damn near regular life. He says he's focusing on his music. I'm sitting on a bunch of music right now. And that will probably be some of the realest when it comes to a lifestyle and money and all that. I lived it. Bull pled guilty to cocaine charges and was sentenced to three years in prison. Everybody know what they're doing. It's not like you don't know what you're doing. So at the end of the day, play your role. Bull was released in July 2010. He says he's laying low. You got to reprogram yourself and get back into your family. And that was my whole thing was just to get back with my family. Big Cuz was never charged in the BMF conspiracy. He works hard to keep the BMF name going. We about to put out a BMF compilation. We're about to put out a BMF mixtape. And everybody that we have dealt with, we're going to keep dealing with. BMF is no longer an active gang. But its legacy lives on through its music. BMF is still a brand, and it always will be a brand. BMF will never go nowhere. We're going to always be here. Meech, he raised a bar for the hip-hop industry. From the jewelry, the cars, the champagne, the clothes, the women. I don't nobody will never do this again. There's this many n****s and this much money can't get along and stay together. If I wanted to, I couldn't go back and top it or do it again because it'll never be done like that. You can't build another family. <laughs>